Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to another H Friendly Live event. We will talk today about the Office of Housing at the City of Seattle. We'll learn all about its support for low income households. We'll also hear an update on COVID 19 and a word from our partner, the Seattle Public Library. But first, let's uh, get us started with the uh, land acknowledgement, and uh, we we have a special additional message today as well. So uh, at the City of Seattle Human Services, we acknowledge that we are on the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, past and present. Uh, we honor with gratitude the land itself. Uh, and the Duwamish tribe. Please uh, visit duwamishtribe.org. We'll put that link in the comments uh, or the description. And you know, there is a, a number of things you can learn about the Duwamish people of the inside who are still here. Uh, but you can also find out how you can get involved. And specifically today, we're asking you to click one of those buttons and we put a red box around it there. Uh, we're asking you to click stand with the Duwamish and complete a change.org petition for federal recognition of the tribe. And we thank you for that. Today, though, we'll hear from Emily Alvarado, director of the Seattle Office of Housing and Age Friendly Seattle. It's something that we're doing here at City of Seattle government to help make this city a better place to grow up and grow old. And our action plan that runs from 2018 through the end of this year includes digital equity. And so you'll notice that there is a dial-in option. And I see a couple of you are joining us by phone. Thank you very much for tuning in that way. There is also opportunity for folks to who are watching us online to turn on captioning in English in six other languages. And that's part of our commitment as the city and as a department to language access for uh, people that live here. Uh, in order to turn on the languages, and today we have Arabic, Chinese, English, Korean, Russian, Spanish, and Vietnamese. Uh, you'll click the, the gear on uh, at the bottom of the video and then select your language. But regardless of uh, how you're joining us today by phone, online, uh, or if you're watching this on YouTube, in which case we would love for you to click that subscribe button and be notified when this and other videos are uploaded. Regardless, uh, this is all about civic engagement and making sure that community elders and people that care for them have access to government decision makers and by access uh, and the civic engagement, we are referring to not only learning about what you know city directors do, but also being able to ask questions and provide feedback in a live format. And uh, we used to do these in person for a number of years, over a dozen years. But while they're virtual, you know, you bring your own coffee. But um, we do bring the information and engagement. And in our virtual studio, in addition to Emily, there are also uh, three of my colleagues from the Human Services Department. And they're Michael Taylor Judd, Justin England, and Gita Hamam. Uh, and they will be assisting with today's event. Once your questions come in the live Q&A, one of them will read that question that we select to pass it along to Emily to respond. But it's possible that there may be a question that goes beyond what's being presented by Emily from the Office of Housing or from the Seattle Public Library or from Human Services Department. In that case, we encourage you to call Community Living Connections. This is a network of community organizations uh, in Seattle and King County area that can offer services and resources such as food and meals. Um, and uh, these are organizations in your community. So if you uh, go to their website, actually, it's communitylivingconnections.org. You can see what organizations are in the network um, and then um, see if there's one near you that you can 
walk into if, if they uh, have open hours uh, and see if there are services that you can take advantage of there. And their phone number is 1-844-348-5464. Again, 844-348-5464. And that's communitylivingconnections.org. I want to invite you to come back. Usually I say in two weeks, but this time it's in three weeks because there are five weeks in this month of April. Uh, the first Thursday of next month, uh, the 6th of May, we will be welcoming uh, a, a very exciting panel of, uh, that will speak about better hearing. May is Better Hearing and Older Americans Month. So um, to celebrate that, we will welcome Diana Thompson from the Advisory Council on Aging and Disability Services. We'll also hear from Cherry Perizzoli, who is the uh, Washington Chapter of Hearing Loss Association of America president, and also Director of Audiology Hearing at the Hearing, Speech, and Deaf Center, uh, Dr. Brad Ingro, uh, on that program. So at this point, I am going to turn it over to our partner from the Seattle Public Library, uh, Nancy Sloat, uh, our resident agent in charge of age friendliness at the library. We very much appreciate the library's partnership and enjoy working with you, Nancy. Um, uh, if you uh, unmute your microphone, you'll be live on the coffee hour. Great. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Lenny. Um, you actually always uh, make me laugh when you describe me as the agent in charge. Uh, for those of you who have attended other coffee hours, you may have heard me say before that I really appreciate the coffee hour um, and learning about our City of Seattle government and other government agencies and departments um, and um, how they're supporting and their work to support um, older adults here in Seattle and King County. Um, and I, you know, I'm a librarian, so I'm an information geek. So any amount of information I can get on a personal level is uh, very helpful to me. And I also just want to uh, reiterate that we are very happy to be partnering with Age Friendly to bring you the coffee hour and the sister program Close to Home, which is on the first Thursdays of the month. So. I have a few minutes this morning to tell you what's new at the library. Could I have the next slide? And we are so happy that the library at the end of the month um, will be opening three branches, the Beacon Hill branch, the Lake City branch, and the Southwest branch for some in-person services. I'm sure everybody has been waiting um, for this. The date is April 27th, it's a Tuesday. And uh, if I could have the next slide, I'll talk to you a little bit about what you can expect. So first of all, um, we will have computers uh, in the building. I know many, many people have relied upon the library computers and it's been really, really difficult um, without having access to them. So there may be more limited numbers of computers because we need to distance, physically distance the computers. Um, of course, we'll have Wi-Fi. So if you wanted to come in and sit down and um, use your phone or your tablet or your own laptop, you can do that. Um, we have scanners and photocopiers. I've certainly missed the photocopier in the library. Um, actually, we have charging stations also for your equipment. Um, you can pick up holds, um, and as my slide shows, you can sit. Um, you can get a library card and do other things with uh, to your uh, library account. Um, and uh, the one thing that's missing in this initial opening is that you won't be able to just browse the stacks for materials. Um, at some point, we'll, I'm sure we'll be adding services. So this is a limited um, opening of in-person services. Could I have the next slide? Um, so the way it's gonna work is that um, those three branches will be open 90 minutes at a time and then the branch will close so that library staff can clean it. 
Um, the schedule for each branch will be uh, up at the door and on our website. Um, and there will be capacity limits of 25%, uh, at least initially. Um, of course, masks will be required as well. Uh, could I have the next slide? Meanwhile, we still have many branches where you can do curbside pickup, where you uh, place a hold through our catalog, you get a notice that it's come in, and then you go to that uh, curbside branch to pick up your materials. Um, and uh, you can also get printing done at those curbside locations, uh, even 10 free copies a day of printing thanks to the Library Foundation. Um, I just want to make sure that everybody also knows that if um, it's difficult to get out of the car that uh, you've driven to the library with or it's hard to wait online, um, you can call the branch and the branch staff will check out your holds for you and bring them to your car. Um, we know that we're just phasing in um, all of these services and we have to be flexible just like every other organization and as soon as we can phase in more services safely we will definitely do that. Um, could I have the next slide? So now that um, we have a one month grace period to get in our taxes, I just wanted to make sure everybody knew that we still have tax forms at those curbside branches and the open the, the branches that will be opening. And it's the basic 1040, 1040 SR in English and Spanish, but many other forms you can ask the staff to print. Um, we also have information about um, the organizations like ARP and United Way and other community organizations that are um, offering uh, tax help. Could I have the next slide? And then finally, I just want to talk about two upcoming programs. Uh, one is coming this Saturday and this one is coming next Monday. We've been doing a series called Ducks in a Row with People's Memorial Association. It's about end of life planning and on Monday we'll be talking about estate planning with an attorney um, with tips and tricks for getting your legal affairs in order and also some tips on how to reduce um, the chances of probate. So that's always of interest to people. And then the next slide. On this coming Saturday, even though I know it's going to be beautiful, we have a program called Medicare Made Clear. Um, it's on Saturday morning, April 17th at 10 a.m. And um, it's great if you already have Medicare, you're on Medicare, but you're thinking about changing your plan or changing your drug, drug coverage. This is great information for you. Um, and then if you're turning 65, um, then uh, this is great for planning. So both of those programs, you need to register for the programs on the library's website. You go to the calendar. Um, if you have any trouble finding um, the information, you can call our quick information line. That's a telephone line at 206-386-4636. The next slide, I just wanted to let you know that we have on the library's website uh, a variety of resources related to older adults. Um, we call our program Next Chapter and you can find book lists and uh, resource links and blog posts and our programs all in that one place. I'll read that out www.spl.org slash next chapter. And then my last slide is just uh, repeats the way to get a hold of me at nancy.sloat at spl.org. And if you have any questions um, about our services or have any ideas about um, what the library could be doing to support older adults, I would love to talk with you. So thanks, and um, I'm going to turn this back to Lenny now. All right, uh, thank you so much, Nancy. What a, um, you know, uh, every time you, you do your update, uh, I've always waited for you to say the branches are opening up and you finally said it. So hooray, it's just three branches right now. 
but uh, you know, we'll look forward to what what happens. And you know, thank you for mentioning the the COVID protocols that are still in place and the social distancing and the masking and and the like. So uh, I'm going to do a brief update related to COVID-19. Um, as you may have heard for, uh, on uh, various news outlets, uh, if you are 16 years old uh, or older, you are now eligible as of today for a vaccine. It's not a tax day, but it is a vaccine day or at least vaccine eligibility day. Um, and you are encouraged to go ahead and uh, go to coronavirus.wa.gov, which is the statewide coronavirus information website, um, and then click that uh, button uh, that uh, if you're watching this online, you can see on the screen, it's uh, called the vaccine locations link, and then take a look at where locations are available. And there, um, you know, there's some appointments available throughout the region. Um, you know, full disclosure, I just scheduled my first appointment. So, um, you know, we'll see it. We'll see how it goes. And um, if you don't have access to the Internet, you can find out how to get to, um, you know, how to schedule a vaccine appointment by phone. And we'll get to that in just a minute. But if you're watching us online, you'll notice that there are uh, resources on this website available in over 30 languages, which is really cool. And in relation to that, I wanted to uh, make an announcement about uh, our friends at NAPCA, a National Asian Pacific Center on Aging. They were on the program a couple of months ago, uh, I think back in December, and we'll, we'll link it up uh, for you to, to check it out when you watch this on YouTube. They have partnered with the company Lyft, uh, on providing access to free or discounted rides to vaccine appointments uh, in the Seattle area for Asian American Pacific Islander older adults. So to schedule, you can of course email them at admin at napca.org. And there are also phone numbers in language that you can use. Uh, the English language line is 1-800-336-2722. The Cantonese line is 1-800-582-4218. The Mandarin line is 1-800-683-7427. Um, the Korean line is 1-800-582-4259. And lastly, the Vietnamese line is 1-800-582-4336. So you can find out where an appointment might be available for you. That hotline is 1-800-525-0127. And on Monday, they're open 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Tuesday through Sunday, it's 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And the same hours are true for the absurd state holiday. If that number happens to be busy, and I'm expecting it'll be pretty busy these days now that everybody is uh, over 16 is eligible, the number, uh, the alternate number to call is 1-888-856 5816. Uh, and if you're watching us on the internet, uh, I trust that my moderators will put all that information in the live Q&A. Lastly, I do want to mention uh, another resource. In addition to learning about COVID-19 and uh, learning about uh, vaccinations, uh, you, you may be experiencing stress that you want to talk so to somebody about. Uh, and that's available through Washington Listens. Uh, and that is a different phone number. It's 833-681-0211. And that hotline is open Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. And on weekends from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, we hope that you will take advantage of, of these resources and uh, pass them along to um, you know, people you care about, uh, and and thank you for for doing so. So uh, it is now uh, my pleasure to introduce our main speaker today. Emily Alvarado is the director of the Seattle Office of Housing. Uh, she has spent over a decade in uh, the public and nonprofit sectors, working to build a more equitable and inclusive. Puget Sound region. Before becoming the permanent director of the Office of Housing in 2019, uh, Emily was 
is manager of policy and equitable development, leading policy and program development, place-based equitable development work, and affordable housing incentive programs. Uh, Emily has worked at nonprofit organizations engaged in affordable housing and community benefits policy and advocacy efforts, including at the Housing Development Consortium of Seattle King County, the Housing Consortium of Everett and Snoqualmish County, and Pittsburgh United. Emily has a JD from the University of Washington, where she was a Gates Public Service Law Scholar and a Bachelor's in American Studies from Scripps College in California. Emily, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us. Um, welcome to the program. Please remember to unmute your microphone. You are live on the Civic Coffee Hour. Thank you so much, Lenny. Thanks for having me. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here today on this beautiful day. Um, as was said, I'm Emily Alvarado. I'm the director of the city's Office of Housing. And I really have the privilege today to talk to you about housing and what the city offers, how we can be your partner in helping make sure you have safe, affordable housing and what we do for the city at large. Lenny said earlier as part of the last segment, don't wait till the end to ask a question. The most fun part of me being here today is gonna be to hear your questions and engage with you. So please put them in the chat now so I can make sure to be responsive to what you want to hear about. Next slide. So if you don't know that the city has an office of housing, we do. And our mission is to increase opportunities for people of all incomes to live in our city. And the way that we do that is really by targeting programs and investments and policies to serving those who are the lowest income households in our city to make sure that all people can afford to live in the city. We do a few things. We're probably most well known for being the steward of the Seattle housing levy. That is a seven year property tax levy. And we have used that for over 35 years to invest in affordable homes. We also steward our city's incentive programs that helps to make sure that in almost any market rate building that you see created across the city, they're contributing to affordable housing in some ways. Um, and so we work on those programs. And also I'm excited to tell you today about some of the great programs we have to make sure that homeowners, um, that there's access to homeownership for people who haven't been homeowners and for those who are, that there are programs to help make sure that you can live in healthy and safe homes. Next slide, please. So I know that uh, Lenny was just talking about uh, COVID-19 and access to vaccines. We know that the last year and a half of the pandemic has been really challenging for folks all around, but in particular has meant that many people are struggling to be able to pay their rent. I wanted to let you know about some of the steps that we're taking to make sure that we can provide rent assistance to our community. So first and foremost, um, don't worry, money is coming soon. So don't see this slide and figure you have to run out immediately. The city just passed, just this week, passed 23 million additional dollars to go to support renters who are unable to pay their rent. And look, we know that this is a significant problem in our community. We're seeing data that shows that 10 to 15% of renters are behind on their rent. We wanna make sure that we're able to support you. So the newest rent assistance that's coming out is available to low-income renters who have been impacted by COVID. That's a wide term. So if you haven't been able to pay your rent because something's happened to your income, you are likely eligible, so long as you're in the right income band. And then this assistance can provide up to 12 months of rent assistance, but we're focusing first and foremost on those folks who are behind in their rent. We in uh, uh, it is June 30th of this year that the city's eviction moratorium lifts. Right now, you cannot be evicted for not paying your rent, though we encourage you to do so if you can but you cannot be evicted. On June 30th, that eviction moratorium is gonna end. So we really wanna make sure we're able to support people with rent assistance now 
so they get current on their rent. So new resources will be out. There'll be more information on our Office of Housing website that I'll show you at the end of this presentation of where you can go to get rent assistance. But just for one piece of information, the best way the general public can get rent assistance will be by visiting United Way of King County's website. It will be at uwkc.org slash rent help. And we'll give more information on our website about how to access that rent assistance. It will be coming live in mid-May. So stay tuned and we'll help to get assistance to you so you can maintain your housing. Next slide, please. We also know that there are many homeowners right now that are also having a hard time paying their mortgage or paying property taxes or homeownership association dues. So if you are one of those homeowners, we really encourage you, the best thing to do is to seek help sooner rather than later. The City of Seattle's Office of Housing makes investments in an organization called the Washington Homeownership Resource Center. They can provide advice and guidance, including in a range of languages. So language access should not be a barrier to you. There's live translation at the Washington Homeownership Resource Center. And at that place, you can find more information and guidance about how you can help maintain your home, including how to learn about the Office of Housing's foreclosure prevention loan. We do offer loans through the Homeownership Resource Center of up to $30,000 to help you pay for your mortgage, property taxes, homeownership dues if you are income eligible. So again, step one, don't wait till it's too late. Call the Washington Homeownership Resource Center. Their phone number is 877-894-4663 to help get some support. Next slide, please. We know that um, there are many um, people who are currently homeowners who also have things happen to their home that makes it challenging to live in. If you need floor repairs or electrical upgrades or you have something wrong with your plumbing or your side sewer, I have a side sewer problem so I do know about that. Those are issues that can sometimes be hard to afford to make those upgrades and we know that a home is someone's most important asset. We don't want you to lose your home over a $20,000 side sewer repair. So to that, we have a home repair program. I love this program. I'm excited to tell you about it. We offer zero interest loans. We also offer grants for those folks who are not eligible for a loan. And what we do at the Office of Housing is we provide you with our own staff who are your partners in helping you to negotiate bids and to work with contractors to think through how you can get projects done. On average, our projects are around $6,000, but it can go, we invest as little as $3,000 and up to $45,000 in these home repair loans and grants. So if you're income eligible, income eligibility, is for a single person household making roughly $61,000 per year. If you make less than that, you might be eligible for one of our home repair loans or grants. We also wanna make sure that people are living in homes that are energy efficient, that are warm and that are comfortable. And we know that as homes age, they can create some challenges for warmth and safety. We offer at the Office of Housing free improvements to your home that are energy efficiency to save energy and also save money. Those projects also are managed by our staff. So you get to work with fabulous city employees who will help you manage those projects. And one of the best things that we could do is we do conversion of oil to electric heat. If your home is still running on oil, we would love to help you convert that to electricity. It is more efficient and it will save you money. You can contact for any of these programs, our office and our Healthy Homes initiatives. You can call 206-684-0244. And I'm sure Lenny or another great person on the team will help publish some information about how you can reach those programs. Next slide, please. 
The thing we might be known best for at the Office of Housing, even if you didn't know it, is that we help to fund affordable housing across the city. And primarily what we do is we fund affordable apartments for low-income people. I should say that our Seattle housing levy, and I'll talk more about this later, was in fact founded on providing senior housing first and foremost. And we maintain our investments in senior housing as a real priority for the Office of Housing. But we have two main ways that we create affordable apartments. The first is, as I talked about, a lot of market rate buildings that you see across the community. Actually, inside there, they're using programs either called the Mandatory Housing Affordability Program or the Multifamily Tax Exemption Program, or both. Really unfriendly names for those programs. But because of those programs, there are units in the apartment buildings that have capped rents. They are affordable and they need a person who's income eligible to live inside them. So we have 5,400 units across market rate buildings that are affordable apartments. Um, and for single people, what does affordable mean? It's a good question. It varies depending on our programs. For the market rate building programs, um, a single person household, um, your income, if it's between $49,000 a, a year or $57,000 a year, that's the right program for you. It shows the rent levels on this slide for studios and one bedrooms. Um, to learn more about those buildings, where they're located and how you can apply, we have the website here, seattle.gov slash housing slash renters slash find dash housing. And then we also have city funded apartments across the city. Because of our investments, we have 13,000, over 13,000 um, apartments across the city that are affordable. Many of them you maybe didn't even know that were funded by the city of Seattle. Um, and for most of those, those are serving lower income households. Um, the income limit for most of those apartments are 50% of what we call area median income at around $38,750. Um, there are studios and one bedrooms. And to find out about those buildings, you can go to the same website that I just mentioned. Someone posted in the chat about hearing about a home sharing program that helped match older folks with um, other available apartments. I will admit, I don't know about that program, but I'm happy to look into it and follow up um, with this program to provide more information. Thanks for that question. Next slide, please. So I talked about how our housing levy was built on the premise of creating safe, affordable homes for older adults. Um, that's what it was for many years, and we've transitioned it to be a broader housing levy, but one of our primary population focus continues to be around senior housing. We have about a thousand plus apartments that are specifically in senior communities for folks 55 and over or 62 and over. They're located across the city. Um, for example, if you've ever been to Pike Place Market or if you live at the LaSalle Apartments, you'll know that there's a building right there that's been funded by the city of Seattle. Or if you're in the Central District or walk around the Central District, you might see Cannon House, which is also funded by the city of Seattle's Office of Housing. Um, we seek to continue our investments in the Seattle housing levy so that we can make sure we have more apartments across the city. Next slide, please. I'm really excited that in recent years, we're hearing more and more from communities of color who are interested in ensuring that there is culturally appropriate senior housing in their neighborhoods, in communities across the city. And so, for example, a Filipino Community Village, you see a picture on this slide. Filipino Community Village was a project supported by Filipino communities of Seattle and they availed their own land to build senior housing with city funding above to provide culturally relevant senior housing. We also just made an investment with Community Roots Housing to produce our city's first housing that's focused on serving unique needs 
of LGBTQ seniors in Capitol Hill. And even more recent than that, we supported Ethiopian Community in Seattle, another community organization, in using their land to invest in affordable senior housing um, uh, to make sure that people of multiple communities have an opportunity to have culturally relevant senior housing. In addition to us, I should have said this at the very beginning, we're not the Seattle Housing Authority. Most people confuse us with the Seattle Housing Authority. We're not, we're your city's office of housing, but the Seattle Housing Authority also offers over a thousand more low-income senior housing apartments than what we invest in as the city. Next slide, please. So I think one of the reasons why I was invited to speak in April is that April is National Fair Housing Month. And I should say that fair housing is something that is um, I am personally really passionate about. And it's about ensuring that our housing policies and our investments and our practices do not perpetuate discrimination and segregation. And in fact, that we take even more actions as a city to affirmatively further fair housing choice and undo the practices of government in the past that has facilitated segregation and discrimination. So April is Fair Housing Month and it celebrates Fair Housing Month because in April of 1968 was when uh, the federal government passed the National Fair Housing Act. And that Fair Housing Act was Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act. It was an expansion after several civil rights legislations were passed. And I wish I could say in reflection that it was a common sense bill for the government to pass, but actually there was significant controversy in passing this legislation. Um, one of the uh, really incredible stories was Senator Edward Brooke at the time from Massachusetts, African-American Senator from Massachusetts, who went to the Senate floor in defense of the, civil, of the Fair Housing Act and explained that he, when he returned from World War II, he was unable to provide a home of his choice because of his race. Um, and so there was a lot of debate about bringing along the civil rights, uh, the Fair Housing Act in the Senate. And um, it was on April 4th, 1968, that the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. was really one of the acts that um, pushed uh, President Johnson at the time to really ensure passage of the Fair Housing Act as part of Dr. King's legacy. And so today we continue to implement and ensure that we are able to further fair housing. I should say that it was much later as implementing the Fair Housing Act that there became a specific carve out to ensure that government could help support senior specific communities. And that was in 1988. Um, and even more recent than that, just a few years ago under the Obama administration, there were more steps taken to really push to make sure that we're not just stopping discrimination, but we're actively undoing the racist housing policies of the past. Next slide, please. We know that we have much work to do around fair housing. We still see the impacts of segregation and discrimination today. I want to say in particular, our office is focused very much on ensuring access to home ownership for Black and Latino households, among others, who have been left behind on home ownership investments. If you'd like to know more about the ways in which we can support first-time home buyers or existing homeowners, please always contact our office and we continue to work hard to affirmatively further fair housing choice. Next slide, please. Nonetheless, discrimination still happens. And if you feel like you have been discriminated against in housing, whether by a landlord or a, a mortgage lender or someone else, 
you should contact the Seattle Office for Civil Rights. They are our local enforcement arm of um, fair housing complaints, and they can be reached at 206-684-4500. I've included their website. Please make sure if you believe you've experienced discrimination, you contact the city's Office of Civil Rights. We believe in fair housing and we'll be there to support you. Next slide, please. I like to think that the best part of my job uh, continues to be fielding questions from the public to make sure that when we're doing our work, we're being responsive to you and your needs and your priorities. So our line and email address is always open. It's listed here, 206-684-0721 is how you contact the Office of Housing to either talk about policy, learn about our programs, or to see if you can apply for any of the services that we're able to provide. Are there questions? I do want to thank you, Emily, for your presentation. And um, uh, definitely uh, a lot of appreciation, uh, you know, both professionally and personally for, uh, for the Office of Housing for providing these programs and these uh, opportunities for uh, low income, uh, um, you know, homeowners and renters. Uh, and especially for older adults. So um, I also appreciate whoever asked that question about home sharing. Uh, and Emily, thank you for offering to follow up. We, uh, what, the way we can do that is we will upload this uh, up on our YouTube channel, which is listed in the Q&A. We invite you all to go ahead and click the subscribe button so that you uh, will know as soon as this is posted. And then we can post this question as one of the comments and then um, once more information becomes available, Emily or we can follow up and, and post an answer. So again, thanks for all the engagement. And this is a cue for everyone who is watching us online to go ahead and type in your questions for Emily and perhaps maybe for um, Nancy since the libraries are now gonna be opening up slowly but surely. But before doing that, we're gonna go over to the phones uh, and uh, make sure that folks there uh, can um, uh, ask their questions. So. Well, not hearing any questions, we do appreciate you for being here uh, on the phone. Uh, we uh, take pride in offering this uh, sort of a low tech approach to uh, virtual programming. Uh, we want to encourage you to invite more uh, of your friends and neighbors to, to join us that way. I'm going to go ahead and uh, close the line at, at, at this point uh, and uh, then go over to our online audience and take a look at what questions are available uh, there. Thank you, Lenny. A question that came in is, what is your opinion about what it will take to truly balance the very high and rising cost of housing in Seattle? Thank you for that question. I really appreciate the um, opportunity to talk about the big issues, um, how we address our significant affordable housing challenges. Um, what I like to say is that um, there was a time uh, previous to the 1970s when the federal government made substantial investments in affordable housing, primarily by investing in our public housing authorities. And over the many years, we've seen a decrease in investment from the federal government We've also seen growing income inequality. We've seen issues like the fact that SSI doesn't keep up with the cost of rents in our city. And so we have to do as much as possible to ensure that we're able to create more affordable housing that fits to the incomes of people in our city. Um, so we're doing that through investment of the Seattle housing levy, but you're right, that's not enough. So we need to scale up those investments in partnership with our federal government, creating more investments to make sure that the housing is not just provided by the market, but is also provided by our partners in the public and nonprofit agencies who can make sure that that housing is affordable. So we like to think that it's gonna take 
subsidy and investment of our public resources. It's going to take partnership with the private market through the incentive programs that we're providing it. But it's going to need to be at a real scale to make sure it makes a meaningful difference. We've seen it become more unaffordable in Seattle, and we want to reverse that trend with more investments in affordable housing. Thank you, Emily. There is another question, I believe, uh, in the chat. So I'm going to turn it over this time to our other moderator for that co audience question. Thank you, Lenny. A uh, question came in. Uh, pretty specific here, Emily. Is there anything for people with incomes between $38,750 and $49,000? So maybe you could talk a little bit more about the different levels uh, uh, of income for affordable housing and how we fund those. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I'm going to roughly eyeball that, and so my math isn't going to be perfect, but our investments in affordable housing primarily focus on folks who are at or below 80% of the area median income. And 80% of the area median income right now for a household of one person is about $61,000 per year. So almost all of our investments are below that amount. For the incomes that are listed here, I'm going to eyeball that that's roughly folks who are between uh, around 50% of the area median income. And what I would say is that almost all of our investments in affordable apartments are targeted at that income level. So before earlier, and I think someone posted in the chat, we have um, uh, uh, apartment buildings that we fund in partnership with nonprofit organizations, nonprofits like Bellwether Housing, Community Roots Housing, Seed, um, Plymouth Housing Group, and many others. And those agencies rent apartments at these income levels because they've been funded by us. And again, if you go to the Find Housing website on the City of Seattle's Office of Housing website, you'll see where some of those apartment buildings are. But I would say that the incomes that this person has listed in the question is probably our target population for most of the investments that we make in apartment units. All right. Uh, thank you for addressing that very uh, specific question, uh, Emily. And uh, we uh, do have another question there. Justin? So the next question listed here in the chat is, does the Office of Housing partner with uh, HUD at the federal level on developing affordable housing? Great question. Um, so I will say that we do partner with HUD. Um, we have, I will say that in the last few years, we've seen fewer resources from HUD come into our community. And so there have been fewer partnerships. But one of the programs that's the best partnership between the Office of Housing and HUD is our uh, HUD is the HUD 202 program. And that is a senior housing specific program. And I just had the privilege of talking to HUD last week about how much they think that they're going to grow their HUD 202 program. What that program does is it invests the uh, resources to build senior housing and then also the operational support to make sure that rent can be paid in senior housing buildings. And we have many examples where HUD 202 money is paired with support from the Seattle Housing Levy and the Office of Housing. Just a few years ago, up in Northgate, there's North Haven Apartments. We funded a new phase of North Haven, and that will combine HUD 202 money with Office of Housing money to provide long-term, permanently affordable senior apartments. So that's one of the best ways that we partner with HUD by bringing together our resources. The other thing that HUD does is they are the primary allocators of housing choice vouchers sometimes known as Section 8 vouchers, which are administered by the Seattle Housing Authority. Pretty recently, the Biden administration articulated their interest in expanding housing choice vouchers and making them more universal. That would be a big deal in housing policy and in making sure that we can support people who need housing assistance. 
if those are created by the federal government, they will flow from HUD to the Seattle Housing Authority. And we work very closely with the Seattle Housing Authority to make sure that there are buildings that are affordable to people who can live in them with housing choice vouchers. So thanks very much for that question. Working, doing housing work takes a real strong partnership between your local city government, your county government, state and federal government. Um, back to the question earlier about how do we really make a difference in the affordable housing crisis that we have in our city, that partnership across all levels of government is gonna be necessary to do so. Thank you for acknowledging that, uh, Emily. We, um, uh, we appreciate knowing about the partnerships. So uh, on behalf of uh, Human Services Department and uh, the Seattle Public Library, I'd like to thank the Office of Housing for uh, being our guest on the show today. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we are gonna continue this conversation uh, on the YouTube channel once this is uploaded, but uh, Emily's information, uh, contact information for the Office of Housing is up on the screen again. We do encourage you to get in touch with the Office of Housing about um, anything that you heard about today or maybe still have a question about. Uh, before we go, uh, I'd like to, um, you know, we, we talked about May being better here in month. It's also known as the Older Americans Month. Uh, and their theme for the month in 2021 is Communities of Strength. We will definitely look forward to announcing a very exciting lineup of panelists from Aging and Disability Services and possibly elsewhere from the city uh, to talk about, uh, you know, what is the city doing for for older folks in our communities? And um, that event uh, is also the Civic Coffee Hour. It's on the 20th of May. We welcome you to come back. It's the exact same access information. We don't anticipate a change to a platform, uh, though eventually we do hope that we will switch to a platform that allows us to provide language access in more than six languages. Stay tuned for that as well, uh, probably starting in June. And then uh, some of the, uh, the link will not change. It's always gonna be the bit.ly forward slash H friendly live. Each word is capitalized, but the number may be different and we'll be sure to announce that. And speaking of numbers, 844-348-5464. We want to make sure if there's uh, any phone number you remember from today is this one, because really any question related to aging or disability, uh, you, you, you really should turn to Community Living Connections, uh, which at communitylivingconnections.org, you can see the participating organizations. Please give them a call uh, if there's something that goes beyond what was presented today. We really, um, uh, do love the fact that you were here today uh, and uh, we we want to invite you to come back and and um, you know visit with us another time we we want to make sure that you know you know you do become an age friendly champion by you know helping us make the city more livable better place to grow up and grow old and by attending these events you're already doing that by subscribing to our channel you're already doing that uh, and uh, and and we so much appreciate you for that we hope you enjoy uh, the the sunny weather today uh, if you can and until next time uh, take care and have a good one this is Danya <laughs>